And this evening, very excited to have a guest this evening to share with us and educate us all about persistent genital arousal disorder. My guest this evening, her name is Kim Ramsey, and she's a nurse, and she's been a nurse for 24, 21 years. She works primarily with college health students and part-time in the emergency department. She is currently studying uh, for her master's in nursing and eventually hopes to get her doctorate in human sexuality. She is also a human with persistent genital arousal disorder, and she says that she wants to make sure that we don't forget the human aspect when we talk about this disorder because there's so much shaming and so much, mis- so much misunderstanding about it. So thank you so much, Kim Ramsey, for being here with me this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What an opportunity to actually explain what's going on. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. So you sent me a definition of persistent genital arousal disorder, and I'm going to read it for our audience because chances are not many of them have heard of what this is. And I've heard of it vaguely, but I haven't actually studied it. So this is going to be a wonderful learning opportunity for me as well. So the definition that you sent says that persistent genital arousal disorder, also known as PGAD or restless genital syndrome, or persistent genital arousal syndrome, is a condition characterized by unrelenting, spontaneous, and uncontainable genital arousal in females. The condition may or may not include arousal with orgasm and or genital engorgement. The patient's arousal is not linked to sexual desire. Because PGAD people involuntarily challenge medical and sexual norms, they are often culturally, emotionally, socially, and medically marginalized. This leads to economic, political, and interpersonal dynamics that can cause the patient severe distress. We are humans with a disorder that has not yet been fully ratified by the medical community, and therein lies the problem. So you yourself are a person with persistent genital arousal disorder. Could you share a little bit about your story, please? Oh, absolutely. So let me see. In 2001, I was it was a, a rainy day, and I was living in an apartment in Newark, and I ran um, up the steps to try and get to my apartment because the elevator was broken. And I slipped and I missed eight concrete steps and I fell on my back, Um, winded me a bit and I had physiotherapy, didn't think much of it. 2008, that's like seven years later, um, I was in an intimate situation with a partner and um, after my partner went home and went went back to New York, um, I continued to have sensations of orgasm and arousal and pain, pain in my back. So I called him and I said, well, did you use something? Did you use an aphrodisiac? Um, In the Jamaican community, we had something called Spanish fly. Um, So I I was very, very uh, scientific about it. I was like, well, maybe that's rubbed off inside of me and maybe this is what's causing the sensations because I'm really quite engorged and I'm still having the orgasm. So that was day one. He vehemently denied this um, situation, like this is all natural love. Okay, fine, it's natural. Today's day two. The day two, I continued with orgasm. Day three, I was thinking I'm either going mad or I'm having some kind of hallucination of some kind, but my body, you know, I still had engorged breasts, engorged gentle area. Day four is when it started to dissipate. So at this point, right, it sounds really, really odd, um, but I was up up to 100 orgasms per day, which makes makes it very challenging when you're working in an emergency room and you're asking somebody about their allergies or their their illness and you're thinking could you hurry the hell up because I really have to just relax somewhere and it was very challenging I remember saying to myself I can't approach a doctor because they, they're not going to believe me um, I spoke to a very very um, safe friend like someone who I would trust with my life and she was like well it sounds like you've got this thing called PGAD or persistent genital arousal disorder and I was like yeah G-T-O-F, get, the, get, get out of here, like really, get the F out of here. I don't 
I, I just completely dismissed that, and I never slept with that bloke again, ever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ever, okay? It was like, okay, you're deleted. <laughs> I, I, well, I, could, I could totally see why. I mean, it's, you go along and you're fine, and then all of a sudden you've got this uncomfortable situation going on. So can I pause you there? there when you say you're having up to 100 orgasms a day? Are you talking mm-hmm. like... Like like climactic, like clitoral orgasms, the way we think of orgasms. Are they like more mild orgasms? Like, could you would you be willing to describe the um, intensity? It depends on like they were vaginal. It felt like they were inside, mm. and not to the arch um, arching of back, but my pelvis felt like it was contracting. Yeah. Um. Very uncomfortable. Overly yeah. tight. Very bloated, and none of the. You know, like my breast was still fully engorged. That didn't go down. So it was like the body was just continuing to react. I felt very uncomfortable, like miserable as sin. Mm-hmm. You know, people kept asking me, are you okay? Are you all right? Um, no, I'm not all right. I'm not all right at all. But I couldn't explain it. And I didn't feel comfortable enough to explain it for fear of being laughed at. So I just kind of like, it wore, it wore off. And I was like, okay. I think he used something. I rationalized it like any logical person would. I think he used something. This is really painful. I never want to do this again, ever. Right. And that was it. Nixed it and called it a day. Um, so then in 2012, it happened again. And this time there was the partner then, he was there to witness it. And he was like, oh, my God, look at your body. And he could see that there's something strange. It was It's a sense of urgency and then these symptoms keep coming and coming and coming. Uh, no pun intended. Yeah, but but up, up. <laughs> it's just like, uh, it was very painful. So we tried all sorts of like, you know, you, you kind of think of the remedy that would help. So the area's engorged, it's swollen, so let's apply ice to it. And sometimes that works. It doesn't, well, it doesn't work. Um, try squats to try and move the blood flow away from that area. Um you know, finally, I said, you know, I really do need to see a doctor. Something's really wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And I can't live without knowing what's wrong. And so I went to see a very famous specialist who was able to give me a true diagnosis. Um, the true diagnosis was actually supported by the fact that I had an MRI of my pelvis and my spinal process. And in the lower aspect of my spine, I had cysts on uh, S1 and S2, which are the areas where orgasms originate from. Mm -hmm. So they think that maybe the the trauma that I sustained to my back, and I've had falls since. I've, you know, slipped over and fell on my tailbone on black ice in in New Jersey, and I've bumped over this one, um, another fall also in the snow. So... You know, they think that that um, amount of trauma may have caused the cyst. Uh, it, it, it became a reality. Mm. So I was like, okay, let me talk about this reality because, you know, naive as I may be, I trusted the media. And then I spoke, I wrote an essay regarding the matter and the essay um, was sold to a, a rag in London called The Sun newspaper. Now, if you know anything about England, the sun makes the inquirer look respectable. So, <laughs> that being said, my story went viral um, within maybe 30, 40 minutes of it being announced. Um, and then um, it went global, which is even more disconcerting because then people were calling me at my job. Yes. Um, and they were making all different types of um, assumptions about myself, my profession, my personal life, and my family, and my spirituality. So I became, I was demonized within a matter of hours. Very painful experience. Quite I would glad imagine. to say that um, I survived it. So that was in August 2012. And then in December... No, yeah, the end of November, the 30th of November, one of my peers, because I actually found an online community that I could talk to, um, one of my peers also decided to go public. She spoke to the Tampa Bay Times, and um, 
I emailed her and told her, you know, well done for going out. I mean, it's, we all know that it's a painful experience. You're going to get stoned with words. You're going to get the, the trolls coming out in their droves to tell you what, what you need, like corrective rape will solve it or this kind of stuff. And you're going to have people mock you left, right and centre, right? And she came mm. out and within 24 hours she was dead because she committed <gasps> suicide. Oh my God! Yeah. So along with having the, you know, the the pain and discomfort of having a neurological disorder that you can't control, Correct. then you have the pain and the shaming of the media and just people who completely don't understand it. And because we live in a sex negative culture, they're going because it has something to do with sex and women. Of of course, it's going to be they're going to jump on it like you know flies on shit, so to speak. Pretty much. We, Pretty much. So I, I, you know, I honour Gretchen Milan, and she, she um, died a terrible death, and, and, and one that, you know, you you wish could have been prevented if they'd listened to what she had to say. And I did speak to the woman who did her story, who was absolutely devastated. You know, it was yes. very devastating for our community. And Gretchen's actually one of three women who have died. One um, being this year died a couple of months ago, also committed suicide, all three committed suicide. So I'm, you know, I, I do not like being embarrassed. I don't like being shamed. Um, I don't like shaming people. But I will take, you know, I'll take it like a champ just to avoid hearing the death of another human being. I, I really can't stand it. I think that, you know, the media has watched our community for years. If you know anything about PGAD and if you don't know um, you can google and do the research yourself but there was a program on 2020 um, the ladies that were on there Jeannie, Heather, I can't remember the other lady's name but they did a program on it then there was a feature or an episode of Grey's Anatomy where an actress portrayed what it would be like to you know have some uh, kind of multiple orgasm and be at a, a car wheel and have like uh, orgasmic activity where she lost control of the wheel, it's uncontrolled. That is my worst nightmare, not mm -hmm. being able to control the vehicle. Um, so I've done everything I can possibly do to take care of myself. And some of my methods may be a little bit different to others. And I apologize for sounding tired, but my part of my stuff is I, I work a lot. I have two mm -hmm. jobs, so I'm doing 64 hour weeks. But wow. it actually is helping my symptoms because my distraction is, point is really quite high. But I, I just, you know, at, at some point the media t has to turn around and say, okay, we, every, and you'll see it, every so often they'll pull somebody out and they'll, you know, convince that person to step up and talk about something that's very private, makes you very vulnerable, and they tell you that you're going to be in a safe space and we'll get you treatment, and they don't. They ram you right up your backside without no Vaseline. You get, you, you know, you're not protected online because the moment you have that, the comment section, you know, gets you see all these things where people are deleted, and there are some people that just live to insult other people. Mm hmm. We we are going to take a quick break. And when I we come back, I'm curious about the fact that this seems to be a disorder that only impacts women, because no, I think uh, that's incorrect. I'm so that's incorrect. Sorry. OK, great. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to find out more about all of the people that are affected by this disorder, men and women. And find out. I'm curious to know if the media has a different reaction when it's men who are the, the sufferers of this, of this particular disorder. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Okay. You spend hundreds of dollars on maintaining your health and wellness. However, your sexual satisfaction is an area you may often overlook. Don't you think it's about time you invested in your sex life too? If you crave deep intimacy, passion, and mind-blowing orgasms, get the tools you need to take you there. Register for your free video introduction at AuthenticTantra.com right now and make an investment in your pleasure. After all, isn't your sex life worth it? 
Are you frustrated and unsatisfied with your orgasms? Do you struggle with getting out of your head and into your body during sex? Would you like to know more about your G-spot, female ejaculation, and the 11 different orgasms for women? Get the secret recipe for sexual satisfaction and start experiencing the pleasure and orgasms you crave. Visit DaveyWardTantra.com and register for your free female orgasm guide and uncover the top three blocks preventing you from having the orgasms you desire. Welcome back to Sex is Medicine. I am Davey Ward, and I am here with Kim Ranz- Ramsey, Nurse Kim Ramsey, and we are discussing persistent genital arousal disorder, which Miss Ramsey herself is a sufferer of. And so before the break, Kim, I was saying that I thought it was interesting that this is a disorder that seems to only affect women, but you were disagreeing. You were saying that men have this too. Yes, I do. I have um, a number of friends. Um, I'm in, a, in the online community that I'm... A participant of, I have a number of friends that are male who actually suffer with this particular disorder and it's, it's extremely rare and they get shunted from um, doctor to doctor to doctor. Just like mm-hmm. anybody who has this disorder, expect to see five physicians at least. Mm-hmm. So in your experience, so most, this is the thing, that I, the, the little bit that I've heard about it correct in the media, it, it always seems to focus on women who have this arousal. And of course, there's a lot of like laughter and shaming and, you know, like, oh, why is that so bad? And, you know, whatever, uh, this kind of slut shaming they do towards women. So have men been highlighted in the media regarding this issue? Yes. If you were to Google Dale Decker, Howard, then um, you would see that he's the only male that's ever uh, become public and he's so disgusted with this disorder that he's actually, um, I guess, he, he is about to change gender. Wow. And so question, has he experienced as much negative kickback or feedback as women have in regards to this? Worse. Worse? Probably wow. worse. He wow. He gets, um, he's uh, it, it's the the whole thing about having something this rare is that everybody wants to talk to you, but once they talk to you, they manipulate. It's like being pimped out. They'll yes. say, "Oh, you know, we'll we'll help you, and we'll do this for you," and they're making thousands or whatever off of your misery, but they don't actually reach out and give you access to a physician or access to somebody that can give you physiotherapy so that your pelvis your pelvic tone is not so tight because that mm-hmm. seems to be a major problem for many of us that the tone of the pelvis is, is too tight and, and that be I would imagine that becomes really uncomfortable and even painful well yeah the nerves the pelvic nerve the pudendal nerve those are the nerves that feed these particular um, symptoms or reactions they are squeezed upon by tight pelvic floors and, you know, you, you, you're told, there's like a list of no's. When I first was diagnosed, there was like, what do you mean I can't wear high heel shoes? What do you mean I can't wear G-strings? What do you mean I can't drink soda? What do you mean I can't drink wine? What, what do you mean? It was like things that you would take for granted. Or what do you mean I can't ride on a bicycle? What do you mean I can't sit near the plane wing on an aeroplane? Wow. So think, anything that is going to irritate those particular nerves or your bladder, what would you mean I can't eat acidic food? Like I can't do a nice tomatoey pasta, can't do that too often. You you have to be mindful of that because it's going to affect your day. And I can get where people say, well, oh, you know what, that must be bloody marvelous. Oh, my God, she always wants it. No, it's not. You know, when you're, you know, I, I think of, like um, a romantic evening with somebody as gorgeous as Idris Elba. And I say to myself, yes, Idris Elba wants me and I'm looking fabulous and he's going to give me the the time of my life and then let's switch the environment. Let's say I'm at the most important job interview of my life, but my body is reacting as if I'm trying to, to be with Idris Elba. That's not appropriate. What if I'm at the funeral of my father? And right. my body's reacting that way. What if I am 
trying to go about my daily business, but this particular disorder has me in this state all the time. And we are all in different stages. PGAD is so variable that some people are in a constant state of arousal. Some people have spontaneous orgasms if their pelvic floor is, is really not, hasn't been kind of um, manipulated to become looser. Um, and some people just have flares. We call them flares where your system is just like, on overtime and it's very irritating because it affects your sleep it affects whether or not you can work it affects how you engage in interactions with um, other people and if you're a mother and you're aroused but you know you're not aroused by your children it messes with your psych because you're oh. trying to view like okay these are my children I don't view them as sexual objects because there is no in um, stimuli this is a, a um, a situation that's just responding. Your body's responding in a certain way. So you have to learn how to distract yourself from what's going on around you. So some people clean, some people cook, some people work, some people take medication, some people meditate, some people do mindful meditation. There's all different ways of distracting. But the reality is when you... I was recently bullied online on this website called Medscape. And Medscape actually responded to me and reached out to me because they could see you know, that these doctors were all, all attacking me. It was two or three people that actually defended me. But even down to the women, they were like, well, you know, this is probably the next housewife of the week syndrome. Or, <laughs> or you know, you're making it up. Or this has to be something in their head. No, I'm not a hysterical woman. I actually have sensations in my back that are painful and uncomfortable. And, yes, they happen to be in this particular area, in the private parts. The problem with many of the healthcare providers is that many people are not comfortable about talking, you know, about intimacy and sex. Yes, Be because and they're not comfortable with their own sexuality. And we're actually going to do a show in a few weeks that, that addresses exactly that, that most doctors are not sex educators and are not qualified to, to inform people about what's going on with their with their sexual health and wellness because they don't have the training. So I have, I have a question for you in regarding symptoms. So it, you're describing these symptoms. So is it something like every single day, all the time, you're you're having these symptoms, or is it more like you're going about your life and anything can trigger it? Like if you eat, you know, like you said, tomato sauce. If you eat too much tomato sauce, stress. it can trigger. Stress is a big deal. Okay. Um, so many of us try to keep our stress um, low, but, but you know that's that's kind of challenging. Uh, um, it can be for for people like me who live in arousal all the time. You try not to make that arousal go to the point of no return. So yes. you are mindful not to get into intense emotional situations mm -hmm. or, um, you know, I don't know all my triggers. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I, I know as many as I can. I've, you know, I know that I can't eat this particular food. I can't listen to this particular music. I would be very, very reluctant to walk through a, um, what you call it, a, a perfume aisle in a mall because I don't know how all of the odors are going to affect me but there's wow. one or two that I know as a given are going to make me feel overstimulated mm -hmm. so I know like you know I used to just feel oh my god it's just movement you know so I, I sit down on a, on a boppy pillow when I'm driving in my car but I have to be very mindful because we've got potholes in New Jersey god knows what we're paying taxes for but I'm very <laughs> careful about how I drive, okay? Nice. So, you know, most of the stuff, like I don't do high stimuli, stimuli. even though I work in the emergency room, um, it's something that is controlled to some extent because I'm mm. mindful and I'm aware of what I need to do to help treat a patient. So I utilize my energy in that way, and that makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing because I did not want to be... Um, paralyzed by this this disorder i didn't want to be trapped by it and I, I don't want to get into that mindset of being of being made to feel useless or worthless which is what the media did the first time round. and i do, promised yes. myself after gretchen's death that i would do whatever i could so that I would, we wouldn't have to bury another woman and we buried gretchen she had no money to bury herself so i'm very very you know clear on the fact that 
you can come at me any way you want to. I'm still going to say to you that as a person, whether I was male or female, I have something that is a true disorder. And I would just like the medical profession to ratify that so that we can get a true insurance code so that people can get treatment and we can stop the suicide. Okay, so that's a key point. So that's part of the issue is that this has not been ratified. So ratified means accepted by the medical community or American Medical Association as an actual disorder. So you're unable to receive effective treatment for it. Is that correct? Correct. That's correct. And so what, how it goes in is it will go in as well, a lot of them will classify it. All of my practitioners, I have acupuncture, I have massage, I have PT, um, and then the meditation I do and the chanting, which has helped. Like I said, all of us are different. Some people mm-hmm. prefer medications. I do not. I prefer to go the routes that I've chosen. What are the may I, may I interrupt you for a moment? What what would what are the medications that would be prescribed for this? So so I guess it's two questions. What are the medications? Number one and number two. Is this always a case of it being neurological? Is it always uh, those pelvic nerves that are affected? Um, actually, some people there's, uh, at this given time there's a doctor called there's a, there's a number of people that are specialists. There's uh, Dr. Erwin Goldstein on the west coast. There's Dr. Ek- Robert Eckenberg on the east coast. In London, we have um, Dr. Goldmeyer. In the Netherlands, we've got Mark, Dr. Mark Voldinger, right? And all of them have got different approaches, right? So Eckenberg has a certain way of, of treating his patients. Erwin Goldstein has a certain way of treating his patients. Um, what we have come to the, I guess, collaborative c- conclusion is that you have to look at everybody holistically. So mm-hmm. they treat it, they treat the nerve ending. Some people will use Lyrica, some people will use Gabapentin, some people will do nerve blocks to the genital area to prevent the nerves from firing in a certain way. Some people will um, inc- encourage a less acidic environment of the bladder and they'll treat whatever bladder infection if there is. But there are, Erwin Goldstein has a particular a tree. Um, a PGAD tree, and he is adding, I think at this time there's about 14 different causes of PGAD that he has managed to identify. Okay. So, you know, I told you about my cyst, S2 Tylov cyst. Also told you about high tone pelvic floor dysfunction. Sometimes people have it after childbirth. Oh, okay. Sometimes people have it after SFRI withdrawal, after the abruptly stopping an antidepressant. Wow, um, really? So, injury, so, so, horse riding, bicyclists, I know a few cyclists. This, this community is far reaching. Like, I know people in Australia, Paris, Scotland. It's not just an American phenomenon. And I don't so, really sound American to you, do I? No, no, no it's beautiful. No. I'm, lo- I'm loving the accent, uh, accent for our ears. So, it, so it sounds like this is fairly widespread. So, do okay, you know, okay. like, an estimate of how many people worldwide are suffering from this particular issue? The the question would be, but maybe a better question would be is, if we had an environment where we felt safe mm. and not judged then you would probably be able to get a more accurate figure. But I can give you um, how many people who have chronic pelvic pain. And that's, that's a big factor, a fundamental factor in someone who has PGAD. We all have pain. Wow. In some shape or form. In some, and and it, it varies. Some people will say it's sharp, sticking. Some people will feel bloated. It's an irritation. So there's about 30 million people with chronic pain. Wow. Pelvic pain. So I, of, of that component, who is going to go? After seeing how I got treated and then after seeing, watching Gretchen commit suicide, who would actually go to their doctor? And when I listen to people online about what their doctor says to them, like, oh, my God, I wish my wife had that. That's so fabulous. Why don't you go home and play with your sex toys? Oh, my God, what, do you, what are you complaining about? Uh, actually, hello, my insurance is paying for this visit, and you are supposed to be a doctor, and I would pref- appreciate that you talk to me with some element of respect and courtesy. If I'm coming to you and I'm telling you that it's a problem, believe me, I'm not saying this just for the fun of it. Who does right. that? Exactly. Well, and the thing that you're describing is it sounds like, okay, so 
it, it doesn't sound like it's a, a pleasurable experience. Your you your your genitals may be aroused and engorged, and there must may maybe that like tumescent feeling. But the whole thing about why we get engorged and then have orgasm is so we can experience the relief on yeah. the other side of that. So it's like it's constantly engorged. So it's like an itch that never ever 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 gets scratched. That would drive you freaking and- insane. So, and and if you think about it, you know, you get the release. So there's a lot involved with somebody reaching the peak of ecstasy, as you yes. would say, um, or as most people would think. But the reality is, here's the stereotype, right? And we all, you know, I hate to say that, but most people have a stereotype. Orgasms are not always pleasurable. There yes. you go, I said it. Oh, my God, did I curse? I should have just said the F word. But this is what the problem is. If you can understand that, if you can realize that a person could have orgasms, but they might be empty or they might be painful or they're not comfortable or they do not fully uh, satiate that person, you are on the same page as me. Yes. Okay. Yes. And this is true. And I myself have experienced orgasms that aren't pleasurable. And I've had students that have had that same experience. And it's just kind of like this nerve response that happens in your body. And you're like, what the heck was that? So to have this as your constant you daily life experience. I'm mm-hmm. sorry to cut you. After you had that, did you, did your body feel like it needed more? Because that's the problem. Your body feels irritated. It's like, having that continual sneezing sensation where it just, oh my God, I can't stop it. It feels like it needs more. And oh, that's absolutely. the problem. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I've had that experience in my life, but I can't say that it's, it hasn't, it certainly hasn't been consistent. It's like, you know, once or twice in my life where it's just, again, like it's, I can't get enough and it's like an itchy can't, and it's, it's irritating. It's annoying. And I just think uh, I'm just really horny and you know, that that's my thought and it goes away. It's not like it's constant or consistent for like days and at a time. It's, you know, maybe a day every once in a while would, that would happen. I mean, very, very rare. I nothing compared to what you're, what you experience on an ongoing daily basis, but just being able to relate to it just a tiny bit. I can uh, have had an experience where it's just uh, this aching, irritating kind of hunger that never gets fed. And I would imagine that living with that day after day, year after year, would just drive you kind of nuts. Yeah, I'm I'm into year seven. I'm like looking, I'm saying to myself, well, look, you know, my hair's changed color. And my hair's fallen out. I'm saying to myself, well, you know, initially I used to say, oh, my God, it's the stress of the ER. But now I look to myself and I say, maybe, just maybe it might be the stress of living like this where you kind of always on edge. Yeah. You know, so... um, and you you avoid things that you would enjoy doing, mm. you know. So uh, to visit family members, people isolate themselves. People, you know, traveling is is a chore. You don't know when that sensation is going to take you. You don't know how long it's going to take to relieve yourself if you need to relieve yourself or how long can you ignore it for. Um, You don't know what all your triggers are. And what happens is you you end up being distracted. So we get different symptoms like brain fog where you're like, you know, I, I have issues with names. I'm, I'm so embarrassed to say I really hate, like I try to remember someone's name. I, I can remember faces, but I really am I'm hopeless with names. Other people have different, you know, different things. And the medical community has alienated us to some extent. I mean, there's one or two doctors, but most of them kind of marginalize us and think that we're, we're people seeking attention, which we're not. We're seeking wow. help. That's why it's like, okay, I am a human. Please treat me like one. Yes. I am not, be- I'm not asking for anything else that you wouldn't give to any other person. I don't want your sympathy. I told you that when I wrote you. I don't want your sympathy. I just want the ability or the opportunity to be treated like any other patient. If I came there and I had broken my ankle, I would expect treatment. Yes. But if I come to you and I say to you, my body responds in this way, you get some doctor telling you, something that's pretty foul and, 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 and inappropriate. Yes. And, they, and because they, it has they can to do get with away sex. with it because yes. it's sexual. Because they it's think, sexual. Not neurological. Neurological with pain. And wow. the symptoms happen to be in your private parts. Okay. Why can't so that's we key. get past that hurdle? Why can't okay, we so, get past that? So that's key. Let's repeat that. So what it actually is, it's a neurological disorder and Correct. the symptom 
is engorged genitals and arous what we term aroused genitals and engorged genitals. That unbidden is a symptom. Arousal, unbidden. Wasn't like Idris Elba walked in in a, in a, in a, in a um in a pair of shorts. It's like I'm going about my daily business and someone just cut me up at the traffic lights in New Jersey, which is not unusual. But and and I'm you know there's something that's caused that arousal to go to move upwards. You're always okay. for me. I can't speak for everybody, but my peers have different presentations. Mm. Some people don't actually get orgasms. They're just on that edge, on the edge of arousal and on the verge of, of, of having an orgasm, but they are in intense pain. Wow. Okay, so and now that the more that you... I, absolutely, I imagine it would affect relationships. And now, you know, now as you're describing it more, I can actually, I actually recall a couple of clients that I've had who've had symptoms similar to what you're describing. Mm -hmm. So we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to hear from you if you have resources for any of the listeners out there who might know of someone or they themselves are suffering from some of the symptoms or persistent genital arousal disorder. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Thank you. You spend hundreds of dollars on maintaining your health and wellness. However, your sexual satisfaction is an area you may often overlook. Don't you think it's about time you invested in your sex life too? If you crave deep intimacy, passion, and mind-blowing orgasms, Get the tools you need to take you there. Register for your free video introduction at AuthenticTantra.com right now and make an investment in your pleasure. After all, isn't your sex life worth it? Are you frustrated and unsatisfied with your orgasms? Do you struggle with getting out of your head and into your body during sex? Would you like to know more about your G-spot, female ejaculation, and the 11 different orgasms for women? Get the secret recipe for sexual satisfaction and start experiencing the pleasure and orgasms you crave. Visit DaveyWardTantra.com and register for your free female orgasm guide and uncover the top three blocks preventing you from having the orgasms you desire. And we're back. I am Davey Ward and you are listening to Sex is Medicine. And we are here with nurse Kim Ramsey talking about persistent genital arousal disorder. So, Kim, what are some resources for people if they are experiencing some of these symptoms and suspect that they may have persistent genital arousal disorder? I, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. And they're and they're concerned and afraid about going to their doctors because they feel embarrassed and, and ashamed of it. Who who can they contact? Who can they reach out to? I would, well, I think at some point you do have to go to see the physician because they're the people that hold the prescription pads to the blood work. You know, I, I always tell somebody, get a full physical or get some lab work first so that we can, you know, that they can establish that it's not hormonal, that it's not, um, you know, something to do with your, with your pelvis being crammed so with too many, uh, with, with issues with your pelvis like, mm -hmm. you know, diverticular, diverticulum or fibroids or a bladder issue or maybe having your urine checked to make sure that you don't have something that's irritating that nerve, you know, mm -hmm. bacteria. And then there is an online support group that I'm in. There's a couple of them. There's the PSAS. The original name for... Um, this disorder was persistent sexual arousal syndrome and the disorder was discovered by Dr. Sandra Lieblam, may she rest in peace, in 2001. She died uh, a few years ago. But it's PSAS, um, I think it's underscore support.com or hash or uh, dash support.com and that's the support group that has, you know, lots and lots of um, information from people from all around the world, lots, many articles regarding the disorder and what's been done and what hasn't been done. And there's been multiple treatments that just didn't work, you know, treatments ranging from medications, like I said, 
to um, people having electroconvulsive therapy. Wow. Cause wow. The, it's like the research is not being done because, like I said, they, people don't really want to present to somebody who's going to judge them. Yes. And you're exactly. judging people that actually, you know, may never have, have, have had this, these symptoms, are, are in a, a stable relationship, but this is causing them to have problems. But they're, they're stereotyped into, oh, she's got to be promiscuous. And in some cases, some religions c- consider us to um, be full of evil spirits. Wow. Well, yeah, like incubus, succubus. You know, succubus. Like, yes. Yes. So that yeah. you, can you imagine being demonised on that mat in that on that level? So you you have people that will alienate us because they just don't understand that this is a neurological situation as opposed to a someone performing spiritual warfare on me. Do you understand? So I feel Absolutely. Like it's very cruel, and I've I've I have peers that have had to go undergo an exorcism so did it help and it, did, it did not no they continue okay. to have the symptoms right. so you know it's 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 very interesting that people will make a lot of assumptions about us and i'm glad that i live in america and not another country where somebody could have harmed me by this at this point yes you see what yes. i'm saying so all i'm asking for for anybody to you know i i i can See where someone would think this is phenomenal or fabulous or quite hilarious. And I, when I heard about it, I was like, that's effing ridiculous. What are you bloody talking about? Stupid. What, who, who thinks of these things? Mm-hmm. Till it ha- started to happen to me. And then I was like, oh, my God, I'm so miserable. I want to go out. I can't go out. Um, I want to drive somewhere. I can't drive somewhere. Or I can't focus. I can't concentrate. And then I had to you become very hyper-focused because you know you have to do something. Mm-hmm. It's a very irritating and upsetting and distressing disorder. And I keep busy because I don't want to get buried right now. I want to live. Yes. That's all I'm asking anybody to give us the opportunity to live like any other human being. I treat anybody just the same. Just treat me like a human. That's mm-hmm. all I'm asking for. And I'm asking from for people who are not as strong as me. I've got nothing to lose. I've got no husband. I've got no kids. I just want a life. That's all. I'm asking to breathe the same oxygen as anybody else. Just could you just help me? And that's what many of the people feel. They just, you know, we have to beg for treatment. We're desperate. And so you want it to be viewed as, well, what it is, which is, again, a neurological disorder, not a sexual disorder. Neurological disorder, not a sexual disorder, one of pain, and I want them to look at the various causes. It yes. is like what you call, I, I describe it as the imperfect storm. Yes. Something, yes. there's a multitude of different um, factors that contribute to making this person's body respond in this particular way. There are men that have it. They should not have to go to a urologist, a thispologist, a thatologist, a thatologist for them to get just one ounce of treatment. When you see someone who has PGAD, any doctor who's listening or any nurse practitioner, you have to look at it as a holistic um, problem. Don't see me as this black chick with a pelvis that's all over the place. See me as a nurse who has to work, who has to actually function in the everyday world. And and how does this affect me spiritually, psychologically, um, physiologically? Do you understand? I, it, they need to look at all aspects. Absolutely, the whole thing, which is something that Western medicine is just starting, it seems like just starting to to explore more openly is the effect of emotions and psychology and my, the whole holistic aspect, mind, body, spirit. So you gave us one resource, which is psas-support.com. Are there any other resources for people who are uh, experiencing these symptoms? Yes, um, one that's in lifetime, in real time. Um, I'm an administrator for that particular group. And the, the first group, the support um, that I gave you, the support network, is, is owned by Jeannie Lund. Um, she's the lady that I told you was on 2020, mm-hmm. if you ever saw that episode. Um, the other support group is the PGAD support group for men and women, of which I am an administrator. So 
So, Wonderful. you know, we it's, it's a Facebook group. And it's, surprisingly enough, Facebook has become a place where people who have um, not so normal issues actually gather together and they can talk. Um, they can express um, their pain and their misery. And you will get support because you're never alone. And I, I want that to be heard that when you have this, sometimes people do feel alone. Yes. And that's where, you know, the problems start, where you feel like, is it worth, is life worth living? Yes. I'm going to tell you right now, your life is worth living. It really is. Regardless of what other people say to you, what people do to bully you. And I've been cyber bullied. I spent two days in bed after Gretchen died. Mm-hmm. No one could talk to me. Because I knew so- that, that that could have been me. So I'm and- saying that your life is worth living with this disorder. Yes, it's, it's an irritation. Yes, it gets on your bloody nerves. Yes, it's devastating. But your life is still worth living. And I will challenge anybody to show me otherwise. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And just once again, because we're running out of time, how would people connect with that Facebook group? What is the? They can, they can actually go into a search engine and just um, it's the PGAD support group for men and women. Okay, so PGAD support group for men and women. So anybody yes. out there who is experiencing any of these symptoms and suspects this, you know, it's ringing bells for you. Or if you know anyone in your life who is experiencing symptoms like this, you can get support, you can get help, so you don't have to be alone. Thank you so much, Kim, for we sharing have so openly. We a database of professionals that are PGAD friendly, you know, physiotherapists, um, doctors, and uh, therapists, people, counselors who actually understand what we're trying to say. Beautiful, beautiful. And that's so necessary, so necessary for support to have other people who not only have it, but also um, know how to address it and, and, and give people support and, and recommendations for how to live with it more comfortably. So thank you so much, Kim, for joining us this evening and sharing so openly about your situation and your experiences living with this disease and the encounters in the media as well and enlightening all of us. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, and it's been a pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful. And so, for all of you listeners out there, if you, again, if you feel inclined and you feel this resonates with you, the support groups are psas-support.com or as Kim shared on Facebook. And I want to invite you to make sure that you join us next week, July 16th, for our next date date night with Davey. And I'm going to have Jerome Stewart Nichols back on the show to support me in answering your questions. So if you have more questions between now and then, please do send them to DaveyWardTantra.com. I'm happy to answer them on air for you anonymously, of course. And thank you for those of you who continue to send me questions. We're going to be answering questions about semen retention, of course, because you guys love to hear more and more about that. And I'm happy to educate you all about how you can uh, separate orgasm from ejaculation and have more fulfilling orgasms for yourself and your partner on every level. Thank you for tuning in this and every Thursday at 7 p.m. and Contact Talk Radio. Much love, many blessings, peace out. You've been listening to Sex is Medicine with Davey Ward, your number one resource for holistic sex education. Listen to the replay of this and every show at medicinesex.com. That's medicinesex.com. And send your questions for Davey to answer live on the air. Connect with Davy directly at DaveyWardTantra.com. That's D-E-V-I-W-A-R-D Tantra.com. And remember to follow Davy Ward Tantra on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs>